So uh, this is the agility track, so I will talk about agile stuff. So agile should be about small teams, fast feedback, people over process, and all these things. And more important, don't scale. You hear that all the time. But in Red Hat, we already are more than 20,000 people in the company, so not scaling is not going to be an option. And we need to be more agile. And how can we spark engagement in our product engineering department where we still are more than 5,000 people? And while we are a company, a lot of these things also apply to an open source project. You can make use of the techniques here as well. And there are many parallels between agile methodologies and open source development. We work with rapid iterations, we work with feedback and collaboration. So I'm Jimmy Sjölen and I work as a principal Agile practitioner at Red Hat. And this is how we went about to co-create our new vision for the future. We don't need to have corporate goals. Yes, there are those two. And my manager and my manager are here, so <laughs> I keep that up. But what we needed in product engineering was a vision that people adhere to. Something to feel passionate about. Not some corporate platitudes formed by a small group of a top management at a ski resort. Strategic decisions need to be made, sure, but the way we have worked before is not working anymore. And passion is another thing that Agile and open source have in common. We engage in open source projects because of passion, not because we're told or paid. Getting paid is nice, though, and some of us are lucky enough to have that capability. But most contributors don't do that. They do it in their own time, and you need to be passionate about it, because otherwise, why would you sacrifice your time and energy on something else? And in an open source project, we have likely rallied around a shared vision or mission. And uh, in a company, that can vary. And culture in a company or culture in your community is not built and mandated. And in the words of Dave Snowden, culture is an emergent property of interactions over time. And we need to change those interactions. But change is hard. Everyone has a lot to do, and we hope that they still will put in the time and effort to do a change as well. It's much as a culture and mindset shift as a mechanism shift. We don't just need to change our process. We need to change how we act in everything we do. And a team might not be prepared for this. And a team might not want to go this way. And if those teams are a volunteer community, there's no way you could or would try to force them. So what we need is a direction, and then take small steps in that direction every day. And we need to be able to keep this up, no matter if it's uphill or downhill. So it needs to be inspirational. I need to feel part of the journey, and I need to feel I was part of deciding why we went on this journey in the first place. If I am to keep it up when things get tough, and they will, and most likely they already are. And in open source, we don't build for a year and then release with a big bang. No, it's a small steps towards that vision every day. And if the community is going in every direction, the project might be scattered or somewhat confusing for new contributors, but when we all more or less go in the same direction, we build something together. Do one thing and do it well. It's a rephrase from Doug McElroy's The Unix Philosophy. But back to our problem at hand. <clears throat> As many other companies in our business, we face the same market pressures, increased demands, increased competition. We do have agile teams and great performance in many places, but we could need more. And our vice president of product engineering expressed that he wants an engineer to start working in the morning and easily know what would be the most important thing to work on right now. And then to be able to track this task into team goals, product goals, and even back up to the company strategy if they would like to. And at the same time, from the perspective of top management, to be able to watch from a strategic perspective and drill down to task level if they would like to. So it would be total transparency, but without putting more pressure on the people actually doing the work. So enter the open decision framework. It's a flexible, open approach to making decisions. 
You might not want to use it for every decision because then it would rather be more complicated and time consuming than supporting. But for decisions that impact the organization, community, or our culture, it's a really good fit. It started out in the Red Hat people team and a cross-functional group, uh, focus group, research and material from uh, Duke University, Diana Martin, and community resources. The purpose was to come up with a way to better align business decisions with the people to help preserve our culture, giving a framework to demonstrate what good looks like, and offer guidance to both keep it up and also for new people joining the company as Red Hat grew. There was and still is a long tradition of discussions in our internal memo list. It's an open mailing list and I can see a lot of Red Hat people here so you know we discuss everything. And this was a way to guide a more structured discussion when needed. From there, it was picked up by the project management office in their effort to create an open project management methodology. It then spread to IT and engineering when there was a suggested move to Google Calendar, which sparked a lot of discussion on this in memo list. By using the open decision framework, the hope was to support and guide those discussions and land a more open decision. And being an open source company, it was a natural step to then release it on GitHub to the community, hoping it could be useful for anyone else. So within Red Hat, we have an old culture of open source principles. We have open emails and open debates, such as the famous and infamous memo list just mentioned. We share information to be transparent and to get more and better feedback. This translates into open decisions. Be transparent, and people need to know the problem exists to start with, who is making the decision, requirements, constraints, and the process, especially on how to contribute. It needs to be inclusive and people need to have a say in it, especially those that will be impacted by the decision. And make sure to seek out diverse perspectives. And note, while I talk about customers and it says customer-centric, your customers could be the community in an open source project. We use open source principles to make open decisions. This includes open exchange, and whether you're developing software or trying to solve a business problem, open exchange begins when you kind of share your source code. A free exchange of ideas is critical to creating an environment where people are allowed to learn, use existing information towards creating new ideas, and so on. And when we are free to collaborate, we create. We can solve problems that no one person might be able to solve on their own, and those who are most impacted by the change can help influence it. They can help course correct, maybe identify misconceptions and data gaps that exist. And as with our development, we want to release early and often to get crucial feedback. Rapid prototypes can lead to rapid failures and that could lead to better solutions faster. When you're free to experiment, you can look at problems in a new way and look for answers in new places. You can learn by doing. In communities, last part, pointer here is formed around a common purpose. They bring together diverse ideas and share work. Together a global community can create more beyond the capabilities of any one individual as I mentioned. It multiplies effort and shares the work. Together we can do more. It's like the old proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And forming communities automatically builds trust into what the decision process is, irrespective of what the decision outcome might be. And we argue that open source principles lead to better decisions. And open decisions lead to better outcomes, which is what we actually want in the end. The outcome also leads to buy into the decision. An open decision might take longer time, as mentioned, than just having one person decide but it will prepare for a much strong, stronger and faster adoption and make whatever comes next easier and quicker. And we all seen when a BDFL, the benevolent dictator for life in an open source community, decides something the community doesn't agree with, they fork the project and leave. If you do an open decision, the outcome can be implemented and realized and enacted much quicker. And what we love about this approach is that the best ideas evolve. 
That means you're not going in with predetermined ideas. You might have a rough direction, but it means you can get a really far out idea that nobody has thought about because you're not coming from that diverse mindset as the person that raised it. Then again, you will most likely never get a perfect decision that 100% of people agree with. But everyone, everyone has a chance to feel heard. You get an understanding on why the decision needed to be made. You get visibility into the requirements, constraints, research approach, and evaluation criteria. And not only that, they can challenge, discuss, and add to it. And you shouldn't be surprised or run down by such a decision. And we hope that this understanding will help you accept the decision and the way forward and participate, even if you don't agree with every detail in it. So a bit more about the ODF in, in practice then. There are four phases, which doesn't mean they necessarily is linear. So concept define ideate. This is where we want to define what a problem statement is in a very clear and concise language. It would help us solve the right problem and keep us focused. We need to be careful about the scope as not all parts of a decision might be able to be open. There could be uh, regulatory reasons that we might need to do parts of the decision in certain ways. Or there could be financial constraints as in our decision that we were working on, we couldn't bring in 50 contractors to solve the problem for us. So we scope that and say, we have to use the people and resources that we have available. And it could be the viable approaches as to the regulatory reason I just mentioned. And the second part is to identify who can contribute to the decision and also who takes the final responsibility. It could be the CFO to release the funds for it, or it could be the CEO to set the strategic directions. But then again, they are all clearly articulated, clearly bounded, and it means that if something needs to be rejected, it can be explained, and that creates that transparent way forward. Next is where we do our research, engage with the organization or community, and use qualitative and quantitative data gathering to try and pull in as much information as we can. A key part of this is to lower the barriers for participation. Don't set up a call at 9 o'clock Central European time when you have a multinational community or company and some people that should have joined is actually sleeping. And in an open source community, you might have other challenges, such as language barriers. How can we make it easier for non-native English speakers to participate and make their voices heard? When we set up our working group, we made sure to have a diverse team with global participation. And even though our corporate language is English, there were times when some of us non-native speakers had to speak up and say that these phrases and words that you're using now makes no sense to me as a Swede. Or that could be assumed to mean something, but the meaning has different interpretations in different countries. And in the open source community I was active in, our youngest contributor was 15 and the oldest one were 60 plus, and uh, the generation gap in how we communicate actually exists, it's real, and you need to be able to bridge that if you want to have a good form community as well. And also consider different forms of communication. Some people find it easier to talk and discuss, others would need time to reflect and maybe you prefer to respond in writing, so don't limit participation to just one format. And be specific about what type of feedback you were looking for and consider peer-to-peer -peer feedback communication options in addition to formal channels. And then plan the transition. Gather the feedback and think through how you could address or talk to people and respond to them who might not agree with the direction or even be upset. Then coming out of uh, the former phase into design, develop, and test, we have formed our hypotheses, we have formed potential decisions, and now we build a community around it. And here we want to make sure that we have the opportunity for them to get their feedback into the right mechanisms. And not just that, evaluate it and um, acknowledge it. Thank you for your feedback, we really appreciate your input. That means a lot to people to feel that they were heard. And as part of that, we also explain why your suggestion might not be feasible, 
Or if we take your suggestion on board, we highlight the change and credit that person. And then you're showing the incremental evolution of the decision as well. And then finally, launch. Demonstrate alignment with strategy, culture, mission, values. Show how feedback shaped the decision and explain how to provide input after launch. Acknowledge gaps or concerns. We are human, they're gonna be gaps, right? They're gonna be fears and concerns because it could be a potential change. And we might discover something along the way that we need to look into more. Maybe run another ODF process or just have a follow-up on. And these four phases, they are feedback loops. You might need to go back to earlier phases, so it's not a strict waterfall approach. When we discover something new, we might want to go back to former phases just to make sure that we acknowledge that as well. So the way we worked was to time box the phases to keep momentum going and not get stuck because we are focusing too much in one phase, but also to make sure that we get done sometime. So how about that vision then? <clears throat> so in September 2022, there was a call from volunteers and there had to be a selection. The selection criteria for the 22 people made sure we had a good mix of diversity and inclusivity, as well as representatives from all the seven product areas, experience with agile and lean, because we're looking for an agile vision, so that we would have a diverse team driving it. It could be argued that the 20 hour uh, commitment could exclude some people, but they will also get the chance to feel heard in later stages with whatever time they might have available. There was also a requirement to be able to tra travel to the in-person kickoff, which excluded a couple of the initial group because of visas and stuff like that. However, this team was only driving the decision. We're not making the decision. Their role was to engage and engage with their colleagues and the organization and to bring those colleagues into the discussion and sometimes speak on behalf of the, the colleagues and bring them into the discussion or introduce them to how they would participate and contribute into the former channels that we had. But some quick methods. So you got 100 volunteers out of 5,000 people. That's only 2%. If I have an open source community of 50 people, I might get one volunteer, maybe. Yeah, but having a not gigantic community, you could have other approaches to making inclusive decisions. You might not need to use the um, support of a framework when you're not large enough. There's probably a sweet spot somewhere, but I don't have that number. 5,000 5, people worked well. 10 people, I wouldn't use this. <laughs> and we had already seen indication or fallout from burnout, so in our work we were putting people very centric to our problem and upcoming solutions to make sure that we would have a sustainable balance. And in November that year, we managed to get together in three days outside Boston to nail down phase one. We reiterate on the problem statement, which, among other things, changed the original objective of an agile vision to a continuous improvement vision. We talked about what the objectives were, which, which expanded the, to four objectives, but also took some things out of scope. We talked about what the constraints were, such as using the people we have in an organization and that our single view for our products would be Jira. And that probably cost most of the discussion, but <laughs> it, was it was mandated long before this ODF even started. So it was more of a clarification that the ODF was not going to get into the tool discussion. And yet, and I'm looking at the people I know here, we are having that discussion today, still. <laughs> and last but not least, to explore the problem space and prepare ourselves for the coming phases, which would have to be done remotely. We self-organized into three working groups while for three of the key objectives, while everyone then participated and contributed to the overarching vision. Over the three days, we worked intensively both in breakout groups and also in the entire group. We used techniques such as one, two, four, all method, but also did icebreakers throughout the three days 
to get to know each other in a very short amount of time. Not all communities or companies have the opportunity to meet face to face, and then you will make use of whatever communication options and tools you have available. Then we embarked on the journey of feedback. We had open feedback, there were calls, open forums, we used shared documents as a collaborative mechanism where we published our research and our hypotheses and then asked people to bring their feedback. And the statistics here is only from one version of the documents in the four objectives. But as you can see, it ramps up, gathered interest, coming to agreement, and then wraps down again as people started to be happy about the content. Not all comments made it into the final version, and it was great conversation. It was really hard to narrow that vision down to five values and 13 principles. We used our internal portal for decision discussion and the Google Suite. That's, that's what we use in our company. Other companies have other tools. The community have their preferred tools, such as IRC, Matrix, Element or mailing list and forums like discourse and GitHub discussions. We facilitated open forums such as uh, office hours twice a week to accommodate for the time zone differences. We engage in one-on-ones. There is no bad feedback, but feedback that might need to be peeled apart. Is this coming from a personal opinion or a strategic opinion? And then the reason behind it. We went into team calls and leadership calls and encouraged them to contribute to the documents. And that showed that we got everyone from the intern to the vice president of product engineering participating and collaborating. And we needed those people to feel heard. And this led us to a set of outcomes that we were calling version 1.0. So what would such forums or events look like in an open source community? We then launched that in February 2023, and what happened next was the continuous work of spinning up a new team in a hub and spoke model that were committed to growing and evolving the next steps. They might run more ODFs in a more targeted manner, or the, the documents that we have will become a basis for the next set of strategic decisions, objectives, and actions. So a quick look at what has happened since. The Hub and Spoke model includes the Agile leadership team, the ALT, formed as a team with seven spoke leads, one for each product area in the product engineering, a product owner and a transformation agilist who is among us here today. And uh, the ALT and the Hub review practices and goals from a larger perspective with a strategy and roadmap. Each spoke is then semi-autonomous, coming up with their own spoke-specific strategy. Each spoke, as you can see, is made up by several organizations and maybe departments, and those in turn are made up of about several teams. And the hub underneath supports the ALT and the spokes with focused expertise, such as agile practitioners, as myself, project managers, program managers, and product experience engineers. Several me methodologies, this is a hard word, and material is centrally available, such as the continuous improvement framework and then training enablement for common training. Each spoke also has agile practitioners embedded in their part of the organization to support a um, spoke more closely. These are the APTs, agile practice teams that I put in this picture. And the vision is a guide and we all here for the long run because we know that these changes must have the opportunity to take time. And the hub and spoke model is a common way to try to scale while still maintaining some kind of autonomy in each spoke department and team, but it does have its drawbacks, such as keeping the ALT from becoming too political and still being effective. It, and you also want to keep the autonomy and um, the spokes and teams, but still within some guardrails as we still need to function as a large organization. And personally, I don't think that it's up for every team to decide on everything themselves. Some things need to be agreed upon from a central point of view to make sure that we can collaborate within the larger, larger area and central point. At the same time, we don't want to be prescriptive or mandate certain ways of working. And my personal reflection on our approach of gathering all the feedback is that we didn't get the balance quite right by making it easy for everyone to contribute 
and then at the same time gather it all together in a central view. <clears throat> we have the internal portal, the Open Decision Hub, where we host our open discussions and documents, which acts as a discussion forum. However, as we discussed, and not everybody agreed, we open up for feedback and um, discussion and comments directly in the various Google Docs that we have. And already there, we got duplicate discussions and uh, questions. And when you add in all the other communication, communication channels, well, it turned out to be a lot. Maybe it would have been a better strategy to have used all the channels for communication, but only have one source for actual feedback. And we tried to steer it that way. So I had the conversation, well, well, great conversation. Would you mind adding a topic to the Open Decision Hub? Which some did, but most likely not all. And there was also an understanding that if an email or chat thread got more than five back and forth, a video call would be triggered to facilitate an easier discussion. Then you quickly run into the trouble of time zones and calendars being full with everything else, and finding a suitable time slot was really hard. And those that couldn't join in or saw the discussion too late would just miss out. So the hope was to lower the barriers and make it as easy as possible for everyone to contribute in the format that suits them best. To try and minimize the viewers only group. But <clears throat> that would, you know, the viewers only to make sure that they were aware, they agreed, or they could have other ideas that we have not yet thought about and capture them. But it also put a lot of pressure on the working group to gather everything and uh, bring it into one source of uh, information. So it was challenging, challenging scale-wise, but we got engagement from all over the organization. We now have the vision and supporting pillars. The ALT are continuing the work in the hub and spoke model, and right now we're all in, in the middle of it all. Kind of in the storming norming phase, if I refer to Tuckman's um, group, uh, Tuckman's model for group development, but on a much larger scale. But we do have the vision to guide us. I hope you have found some inf inspiration in the possibilities of the open decision framework, because it started as an internal project. I think it's maybe a bit uh, structured that way. So I encourage you to test it out what works for you, what doesn't, and then bring your feedback to the open community. And then we will get the wider community view and we can update and make it better. Now like myself, I'm all about feedback and continuous improvement, so by a show of hands, how many found this talk valuable so far? Thank you. And if, if you would like, I would... <laughs> I appreciate if you just scan the code and give me some feedback that it will take less than a minute to go through it. And I will get some valuable feedback out of that. It will be on the next slide as well because I have some more contact details, but I'm also now curious about any questions you might have. So for, um, but, so, yeah, I wasn't sure what you meant by that. So repeat the question, yeah. So what are the current challenges uh, that we're facing? Well, what I was showing here that we have the ALT, uh, that is now merged with another working group. So we are combining forces there. And I think one of the challenges we had was that, as I mentioned, it might have become too political and we didn't get the traction of the actual actions and whatever we would like to get going from there. And if someone here who knows more than me might object, you're free to comment. <laughs> Any other? Most of you might already be aware of this because I see a lot of my colleagues here. <laughs> yes, Brenda. Ah, what, what do I wish we did differently? Yeah, I, I would have preferred not opening up for comments in, in all different shapes and forms because I think we kind of missed out on some stuff because we just didn't 
see them or manage to bring them in. So you're having only the open decision hub for actual feedback might have been better. Then again, I'm not sure because then it was another hurdle to get people to go there, which was another step than just having the conversation directly. So we could have missed out on other good feedback and contributions, but uh, I think that that was one point. I would also have after, I think it was good, I was fascinated that the first three days with the 22 people, I was worried that it was too large of a group, but it worked really well. Mostly also because of the facilitation of the people in the workshop. And, um, but I would have then spun up the continuous group to be a much smaller, a nimble group of maybe five to seven people only. This group tended to grow and um, maybe set some stages where we didn't allow for all the spokes to be setting their own strategy in, in such detail, but having an overarching vision that this is what we need at least to be able to function well together. That's my personal view. Other than that? Oh. Ah, which part of the creating the vision did I enjoy the most? I think the, the, the most fun part for me was to look at the overarching vision and then nail down what would be the values and principles. We had a lot of things in there. And while it might be, in, I say, five values and 13 principles might be too many, but I think that the five values was formulated in a really good way. And I think uh, I really like those. That was the fun part. And meeting the people in Boston. I've never been there before. <laughs> Jerry, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the question is now when you're merging the ALT with another group, do I see any risk or opportunities using the ODF going forward? And what, what's the next steps for that? I think we might need to re, re communicate about the vision because it's there, but I think we might have forgotten about it and, and focused on details and refocus on the overarching vision and then start building the actions to go in that direction. Take the small steps, which is mostly uphill now, <laughs> but when we get over the crest, it will be downhill again. So that's what I hope for. Get get back to the original vision and then get more actions ongoing so we can show that, yeah, look at this. We are doing much better now than we did before and not plan everything too long and too much. But also the difficulty with people being really busy already and then hope that they will take the time and effort to do this change as well because it will be challenging for many people adding that on top of their workload. That's going to be something we need to address all along.